Hello, hello. Welcome to what could possibly become a regular podcast from us at Lattice. I'm Tom Randall, one of the starter uppers. Um, what's that? Starter upper is is that a word? Founders. Um, anyway, I got Lattice going in uh, the early days, and uh, it was quite some time ago. And one of the things that we thought we might do is have a go at doing a podcast and see how it goes. I have no idea at all whether there's a desire for it and actually we're really good at doing them but you never know these things until you try so it'd be amazing got a little bit of feedback from you who are listening and whether you enjoy this and whether you'd like more even if you told us what kind of stuff you would like to know more about as well that'd be totally awesome. Uh, so one thing that is really important to us at Lattice is our sharing of experience and knowledge in climbing, coaching, training. So the main thing for this today is that I want you to get something out of this and this will always be the aims of any podcast, whether we do one more, ten more, a hundred more, that's always the aim, share our experience and our knowledge. So on that subject, today as the first one, the trial run, the one where it could all go wrong and we'll see how it goes, is data. And with me now, I have Remus Knowles, who is our data analyst at Lattice. How you doing, Remus? All right? I'm very good. Thank you, Tom. A bit nervous, but we'll see how we go. Yeah, I think it will, it'll all be good. <laughs> we, we know each other long enough now that we'll, we'll somehow bumble through this. And, uh, we'll, I'm more worried about breaking out into laughter halfway through because you put a funny face or something, but uh, I'll try and keep my nerve. <laughs> yeah, you don't know what you let yourself in for now, do you? <laughs> um, so... What we're going to do is we're going to reel out a uh, series of numbers and facts off the top of Remus's head. We're going to see whether he is the human computer that we have him on board for. No pressure there, then. And uh, we also want to make this accessible to everyone here who is listening. So we're going to try and keep it reasonably non-technical and accessible for you so that you get something out of this and you're going to be able to go away and improve on your climbing or just know something interesting and understand it. Okay, so Remus, let's go from the early days when we... It seems like a long time ago now. It does, yeah. And when we met, I think it was in a service station. I think you're right, yeah. Um, so I think it was Ollie who got us together initially, wasn't it? And then, um, yeah, I remember you, you visiting family or something down tough. And then, uh, yeah, you were like, oh, yeah, let's meet up. And I was like, you know, oh, this Tom Randall, you know, he knows what he's doing. He's a you know, big climber, you know. And then uh, I remember meeting up in a service station just outside Bristol, I think it was. Um, it was what, you know, like half past eight at night or something, you know. I suppose the truckers wandering around with their coffee and you sat down in some little chairs and uh, you sort of talked all about Lattice and where it was going. And, uh, yeah, I remember just from that very first uh, meeting, I was, like, really interested because um, it was such an interesting concept. It's like, you know, the idea that you should measure your performance for climbing like I've never really seen anything like that before so you know, straight from the uh, straight from the get-go I was kind of hooked in by that. Yeah so one of the things that I was always curious about was that I remember sitting down with you in that uh, I think we we're in a kind of in a booth in maybe Burger King or McDonald's inside the <laughs> yeah, service yeah, station that's right. and I had these pieces of A4 paper and I drew out the kind of the a schematic of what I was trying to do with coaching and lattice and had data on one side and I was really into collecting data and analysing it but I was trying to show you that we wanted to be able to work with or I wanted to be able to work with coaches not, not coaches sorry with other climbers and get them some improvements but I didn't understand how to handle a large enough data and make it into a I guess a user-friendly format did it seem yeah daunting? <laughs> that's uh, it's totally my recollection as well though I remember, I think you even showed me some of your initial data you collected from some of your sort of um, early testing, and you had this um, Excel spreadsheet, and you opened it up, and I just sort of cringed a little bit. I was like, ooh, ouch. Um, so I could kind of see, you know, I, I kind of knew you had the right ideas, and you were after this data, and you knew you needed to do more with it. But I could kind of see there was like a lot of work to get it in a shape that's kind of more usable. Um, so I guess that, that's probably like you know, where we've been going really since that first meeting. Um, just kind of getting the data in a more usable format um, and because you know, when you've got it in a more usable format then you start seeing the power of the data you start to do more interesting things. Yeah I think that was that's a really important thing there was that 
that first initial role that you took with us and how we worked together was managing the data and collecting it and doing it efficiently so that we could get much bigger numbers because until that point I must have looked at maybe 75 to 100 climbers approximately and that was all pretty okay to manage but in terms of scaling it out and trying to do it remotely and do it in person in a number of different countries yeah I didn't have that yeah well because I think there's such a difference between you know when it's just you collecting the data you can kind of keep it all in your head you know you know how you've assessed different people but like you say when you try and scale that out to you know tens of coaches and start um, sending out assessments for people to do on their own you have to be a lot more rigorous about how you're collecting the data so that you can keep all that data quality stuff under control um so there's such a you know it's such a big piece of work to do that to go from one person who has all this you know all these good ideas in the head and it's quite an intuitive understanding of why they're doing these things um, to then expanding it out um, but it's good I think because it it makes you think about all these good issues like you know why am I doing this why am I doing that what can we do to make all this stuff more accurate and so in that in expanding out to more collecting more data it makes you think about these things that in the long run improve your data um, which leads to better better models and then eventually better coaching because you can uh, provide so much better feedback to people based on this data yeah 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 exactly um one thing uh, I've also never, I don't think I've ever asked you is when you looked at that initial kind of system and the data that we collected, was there anything that personally interested you and you thought, oh, I just want to kind of get my teeth stuck into that straight away and start to break that down? Because I, I had a system and I had a way of analysing stuff, but was there something that you felt like you wanted to do? Oh, yeah, totally. Um, I guess just, you know, I had my like data head on straight away and uh, remember when I saw your finger strength scores? Remember when I, the very first time I ever did any fingerboarding, you know, I was like hanging on the fingerboard and I was like, what, is this good? What am I doing? Like, what, what am I aiming for? Where, so I'm like at here now, but what's like a good score? What should I be doing? And I just had no idea of like, you know, for my level, what was a kind of sensible score to be able to do on the fingerboard. And then to see that, you know, you had that initial like hundred people in your data set and then to be able to like look at that and say, oh yeah that's where I should be, you know, this is kind of the rough score I should be aiming for. So that was like the very first thing that popped in my head and I was like, oh yeah, definitely have a go at that. And uh, so that's, I think that's kind of grown to be one of the core parts of Atlas really is the, um, that finger strength model where we can take a climber and make a prediction about where the finger strength should be. Um, and then obviously you can then use that to say, oh, you're a bit weaker than we expect, you should work on that or you're strong enough for your current goals. Um, so yeah, that was the kind of the very first thing that jumped out at me. Ah, oh, cool. That's, yeah, it's interesting to know that because that's become one of the the strongest elements of what we do. So I wonder whether there was a tie-up between what you always... Because everyone does that in life. They have a kind of personal interest and they push, to, they push those things a little bit harder. Talking of those, also those early days is when you first joined us and we kind of worked together, you were still working at Dyson in a, in a da data analytics role. Yeah. That's and I right, yeah. think I was at the time going, wow, this guy... He's a data analyst for Dyson. <laughs> Dyson's big. This has got to be big. What? What did you? I don't know. What did you learn at Dyson? What stuff do you feel like you brought from there and use now? Um, so I think probably the main thing is just a lot of practical skills. Um, so one of the main things I learned is that you know one of the key things to get right straight away is your data quality. Like if you have poor data, it makes everything so much harder. So any models you build on the data just become way worse because you've got all this extra like stuff that's messing with your data up and then that just sort of comes through and messes up your results afterwards and um, so i learned a lot of like yeah sort of practicalities about how to clean up data how to sort of collect data in a um, sort of efficient way um and yeah just a lot of you know got very good at excel you know as you do <laughs> yeah, yeah it's a sort of like it's just that you know learning all those tools that help you make uh make, help clean up your data um, what is what is data cleaning uh, so it, it generally refers to, um, so you know, a classic example would be you've, you've tested 100 people, say, uh, but for whatever reason, maybe 10 of them uh, didn't manage to complete one test. Um, so if you're, you can't just average out all the values across that test because you've got 10 missing values, so that's going to throw your average off. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all dealing with lots of issues like that. So what do you do with outliers? What do you do with missing values? Um, and making those sort of decisions can really affect... Uh, everything you do down the line because say for example you decide not to exclude outliers 
uh, if you then take an average, for example, that could throw your averages. You know, it make your averages much bigger or much smaller than you might be expecting. Whereas if you take them out, they might be in much more reasonable, uh, reasonable sort of ranges. Um, so it's all that sort of making those kind of decisions early on and sort of being able to think ahead to how those decisions are going to affect the, the rest of the process further down the line. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. So essentially it's a, it's a housekeeping yeah. skill that you, you learn about how to do it with data so that the assumptions and the conclusions that you make are a little bit more robust and you're checking along the way that it was collected in the right way or there wasn't I suppose it's type. Is it typos as well? Things like yeah. that. Is that data oh, yeah, yeah, totally. Um, especially with uh, sort of if you've got like low volume data that it takes quite a long time to collect. Um, you know, checking for typos is a really kind of you know, normal thing to do. You know, if you've got a, a strange assessment that comes through, for example, um, it often makes a lot of sense to then go back and talk to the assessor and say, "Oh, was there anything that stood out here? Was you know, were they doing anything unusual?" You know, they might say, "Oh, yeah, they had like a, a bad finger injury or something that I've got to write the assessment." And you're like, oh, okay, so that explains why their uh, finger strength data is looking quite odd. Um, but yeah, that's totally right. It's about, um, you know, it's a kind of house cleaning exercise. Um, and a lot of the, the skill in it is uh, being able to think about how those early decisions are going to affect the later uh, later parts of the process. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that was something that you definitely taught me was that if you're collecting data and we all place a value on it, is that if the methods weren't correct in the first place, is you've just got to take a hard line and exclude that from that global data set, even though you might be thinking, oh, it'd be nice to have that in there. You've just got to take a pretty objective view on it and say, if this wasn't done in this way that we set out, it's out. Yeah. We can we can analyse it as a, a singular thing and compare it back to that global data set, but don't include it in that main data set because it's going to create big problems if it's not collected with the same methods. Yeah, totally. Um, so... Uh, the whole kind of point of this data cleaning stuff is you're trying to, or you know, data cleaning and data quality sort of stuff is you're trying to reduce the amount of variation in your testing. Um, so you want to you, broadly, you're trying to reduce the number of variables involved. You know, so you, what you don't want is like, say you were testing someone's fitness, you don't want them to go and run a marathon the day before they do the test because that's going to throw your results off. Um, so you're trying to control for things like that. And if you can stop too many uh, other factors coming in that makes it much easier further down the line to isolate things you're interested in without these other external factors that you're not interested in messing up all your results so like you say you've got to be very careful like if you know something's wrong with a piece of data it's much easier to just throw it away than to try and take into account all these extra factors that might have um, affected that extra piece of data yeah yeah that's we've, we've definitely learned that over time haven't we yeah oh yeah for sure but it's you know it's a hard lesson to learn because if you've just spent two hours assessing someone, you're like, oh, can we not use this now? It's like a bit of a yeah, it's quite a hit to take sometimes. Yeah, well, it's it's time consuming. Yeah, collecting yeah, quality yeah, data. Exactly. No, it's hard work. And I mean, you you run a, a stat on our homepage on the website of number of hours, uh, is it number of seconds dead hanging that we've collected and number of hours. Yeah, yeah, assessments yeah. and number of lattice board laps yeah. or something in it. So uh, I updated it the other day actually, I think it, we're on about nearly 2,000 hours of assessments now. You know, so you just think about the, the time investment there, it's like, yeah, it's huge. And then if you think you then have to throw away some of that data, it's like, you know, it's a real drag, but you know, it's worth it in the end to get the uh, better models at the end. Yeah, take the, pe take the pain. Yeah, take the early pain, the long term, long -term gains. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what we're doing in training all the time. Well, at least that's what we tell ourselves when we're, we're doing those sessions. You're hoping, hoping. Yeah, yeah. Um, what do you think was the, the main issue that you faced with our data or analytics or software when you first joined us, turning that initial work that I'd done for a few years and our, my spreadsheets into something that was usable for everyone? Um, I think the main thing was uh, trying to consolidate the protocol into like a very strict and consistent protocol. Because I think when, it, you know, it's um, completely understandable that initially when you're developing the protocols, you know, you don't really know what you're aiming for, you don't really know what works, so you're spending a lot of time changing things. Um, so I remember you had a lot of variations on how we did the lactate curve test. Um, so that's when you're developing a protocol obviously that makes total sense and you need to do that work to understand how it affects everything um, but long term what you really want is everyone doing exactly the same test uh, so from going from that lots of variation in how you've tested to 
everyone doing the same test. I think that was the, um, the sort of main challenge early on, uh, just so we could get that uh, volume of data that's very consistent. And then it's sort of like a, a cumulative effect as you get more and more data, your models get better and better and better. Uh, but that starting from that early data set that was quite inconsistent um, and getting it cleaned up and in a state where we could get sort of sensible answers from it. Um, that was, I think that was probably definitely a big early challenge. Yeah, as, along with the finger strength testing that I did in the early days as well. Remember yeah. how I had that homemade uh, yeah, testing yeah. rung and then we moved away from that to a standardised manufactured testing rung that we use now in all the locations. And I think back to some of those very early scores and go, oh, I wish I hadn't used that homemade rung and <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd seen right in the early days, have it machined, have it exactly right. And I mean, we learned a lot for sure in, oh, yeah, yeah. in yeah, those early yeah. times, but yeah. I guess you always look back and you wish you'd done something slightly different. It's the reproduce, reproducibility thing, isn't it? It's like, you know, it, like you say, when you're in the early days, it's just what you have around, isn't it? You, know, you don't really, really know whether testing people in a certain way is going to work well, so you, know, you don't want to invest big money in it. But then once you sort of know it works, having that completely standardised run, it's so helpful because you know everyone's testing on the same rung and using the same hold and there's no uh, or, you know, much less variation compared to your uh, like campus rung edge or whatever you had at home. Um, yeah, yeah, it had a, had a funny habit of in really cold conditions being surprisingly, let's say, you could find advantages on it in yeah. the same way that we see with some of the uh, testing edges that people will use if they're, they're they're getting to hand what they have available and the, that front radius on the, the rung of it's small and it's quite a sh essentially what feels like a sharp edge is you can hang more skin on it. It's like the, if you have yeah, good plasticity yeah. in the skin, you improve your scores slightly. Yeah, it makes such a difference, doesn't it? And like you say, it, um, you know, the, the trouble is it's not consistent difference either. It's like um, every time you test, your scores will be a little bit different because you, know, you maybe you've had a big day out and your skin's really sore and then you're hanging on this edge and it's a bit sharp and it's a bit painful and then you, you, know, you drop off a little bit earlier than you maybe would have. Um, but if you've got like that nice kind of big rounded edge that's really comfortable, it makes a big difference. And then hopefully, you know, long term, it means our scores are a lot more consistent and the testing's more consistent and yeah. that uh, reduces the amount of variation and then better models, better coaching. Don't you find it depressing though how we can't cheat our own rung? <laughs> I, go, oh, I, I test fun. myself every week and <laughs> I go on it and go, oh man, shouldn't I have looked can't can't I get around this? And, oh. It's so unforgiving, isn't it? There's no like you, know, you try and work your fingers into it, and it's just nothing. There's no there's no, no, no there's trick. no nest there's no nestle on the side. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, oh well, you you got to be cruel to be kind to yourself, <laughs> aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so some big topics. Oh. Let's, let's delve into them. Okay, first one, and I kind of want to do this because I think a lot of climbers like reading the abstracts of studies and they like looking at headline numbers to do with sports science or stats and things like that and it'd be really nice to kind of just go over a couple of key things in terms of how I guess statistical modelling works and those key terms that people will see and what yep, do they mean. That sounds good. So the two things that I would like to know from you and make them as, as basic as, as you can, or for, or for me, is what is this thing, or, or what's this number that we're seeing referred to uh, often as an R-squared value? Okay. What does that mean for us? Yeah. And why do we need larger data sets over smaller data sets, or do we? Okay, um, so very broadly speaking, an R-squared value is about, uh, so if you have a mathematical model, to so a, a relationship between a few variables. It's about the quality of the fit of the model. Uh, so it's about how well your model predicts the values that, um, it's about how well the model can make predictions essentially. Um, so if you have a very high R squared value, it means compared to the data we've seen already, our model represents that data very well. So then the, the implication is that in the future, if we see a new piece of data, then we'll be able to make predictions with our model uh, that very accurately match that new piece of data. Ah, so that means that if we, any particular model that we're using right now, whether it's uh, lattice board moves, um, finger strength scoring, if we have a very high R squared value that 
that model that we've created has a really high predictive value for what's being collected so far and what comes in the future from more tests. Yeah, so you can't say for certain that it's definitely going to match any data you have in the future. Okay. So the best you can do is look at the data we currently have, compare the model to the current data, and you can say, okay, this model we currently have fits the data we know very well. Um, and then, like I say, the implication is that hopefully in the future, the new, any new data we get through the model will also fit that data well. Ah, so that's why it's important that you keep going back and re-evaluating, sort of auditing yeah. models yeah, to exactly. check what that value is yeah, doing. Yeah, so as you get new data coming in, you can adjust your model to create a better model. Uh, so as you're getting more data in, you're then getting a, you're improving your model. And that sort of leads into the big data thing. So as you get more and more data, you can produce better and better models. Um, and especially when you have more and more variables in your models, you can have it, you, you need exponentially larger data sets to fit these uh, models, these big, does that make any sense? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what you're saying is if you had, let's say we did a series of tests and we had three tests. We had finger strength, time on a, a test, and a number of pull-ups. You might need 200 people to start to create an okay model. If you then in, added only two more tests into that kind of, that suite of tests or a battery of tests, you're not going to need three or four hundred more, you might start to then need a thousand more or it's, yeah. it's an exponential increase in the yeah, total no, that, number that's of that's exactly it, yeah. Ah. Um, so it, it's kind of like a mathematical thing because um, as you increase the number of variables, the kind of space you have to explore by like taking data points expands much faster than the um, number of variables you're looking at. So it's like um, if you think about uh, like the length of a line and then you think about the square of an area and then the cube it like it just it grows and grows and grows much faster than um the number of variables you're looking at so uh, like a line is one variable and then a, a square would be two variables and a cube would be three variables but so say we take like uh two to the power of one that gives you two two to the power of two that gives you four two to the power of three gives you eight two to the power of four gives you 16 and it's that big growth there so even within like a sort of quite constrained area, the, the space you have to explore to get a decent model really grows very quickly. So if you start getting into these like um, multi-factor models, if you have a lot of factors in your model, you need a lot of data to really have these, to get a good predictive power out of your models. So that must really do your head in when me and Ollie come back with new tests and new factors to add, add into our testing. <laughs> yeah, it definitely makes it, uh, yeah, because that's the thing, you can't just keep adding and adding factors um, because it makes the, the, the space you have to explore really, really big. Um, so you want to try and keep it under control if you can. So a lot of modelling is about working out which factors have the most predictive power. Mm. So it's like keeping your space nice and small um, and picking the kind of optimal factors to use. Ah, uh, yeah, because actually that's a really good point. I remember that we tested for quite some time continuous hangs uh, for dead hanging and we found that there was a very poor relationship with continuous hangs so that's the you get on a, a 20 mil edge for example and you're hanging with a certain intensity and you're not having any break in that hang just going from start and hanging on until the bitter end when you fail so people might typically take 45 seconds 60 seconds for example we we saw no relationship on that, did we? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's pretty much exactly it. Or at least it is a very poor relationship. Um, and because it doesn't have good predictive power, and then we can just chop it out of the model mm. and then just don't worry about it because it's not really, it's not contributing. Um, especially, you have more kind of practical issues as well. Like, you know, if you're asking people to do a lot of testing, doing a continuous hang test is you know, it's quite brutal, it's quite hard work. Um, you know, you don't want to be pushing people to do this test and then actually further down the line, we kind of know it doesn't actually tell us very much. So you want to be quite careful about, you know, both from a practical perspective and a sort of theoretical uh, modelling perspective, uh, how many tests you're doing and um, uh, yeah, what sort of data you're collecting. It, it was interesting that one, wasn't it? Because I would have thought that it would be some kind of, I mean, not great, but reasonably decent piece of data that, or the pieces of data that would come from it. But yeah, yeah, you know, it that's so, why we do guess we do tests and that. Yeah, Look at yeah, it. exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I assume it's just to do with, um, you know, it's not specific enough. You mm. know, at the end of the day when you're climbing, you're not, you don't just hang there. 
you know, you're you're tensing and relaxing and tensing and relaxing. So it's a bit more like a, a sort of repeater kind of protocol. Um, you know, five seconds on, three seconds off, or something. Um, yeah, it's, it's okay. a specificity thing, isn't it? I guess. Yeah, yeah, and we all know it's pretty pretty important. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Okay, next one is, um, or the first one rather, is age. We obviously have a lot of, as you've seen, a lot of clients that we work with who are in that age bracket of 40 to 55. There's a, there's a good number of people that we work in that range. And I guess we all hope as we head towards that zone that maybe through the years we'll have better psychology, we'll drive better tricks and ways of moving and climbing. So perhaps the finger strength expectations for the grade would be less as we, we get older. So I guess the question I'm asking is, does a 40 year old, a 50 year old and a 60 year old need the same finger strength for French A for example? Um, I Initially I assumed that would be true too, but when we've actually looked at the data, there doesn't seem to be a, any particular, um, you know, it doesn't seem to be a powerful predictor of finger strength. So as far as we can tell, it basically doesn't make a difference. Um, if you want to climb A regardless of what age you are, you still need to be, you need to have your, uh, your finger strength the same. Um, okay. Which is it's quite counterintuitive, and that's you know, one of the things I really enjoy in uh, the state analysis. You know, you, you have these things that uh, seem quite intuitive. You know, well, that's kind of obvious. You know, I get older, I get better at climbing. My technique gets better. I've got better tactics. But actually, you know, it turns out that you know you just need that same finger strength regardless. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. And I, I always assumed the same thing would happen when we went down into our junior ranges that we'd have some kind of wildly different expectations of those. But I. I, I mean, I know just I do the sessions and I run them over the years that I see a junior, they tell me the grade and I'm looking at the scores and I'm going, yeah, these are just the same kind of percentage body weights carried for the adults at the same same kind of grades, albeit there's a height factor, which, you know. Yeah, and you know, uh, a weight factor as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's yeah, exactly right. Okay, second one is we know everyone loves finger strength and predictors and... Do we have weak fingers, strong fingers? What do we know about being shorter or shorter than average and taller than average? Is there a significant effect? Uh, so interesting, actually. I guess it is quite a tricky question because um, obviously height is quite well correlated with other factors as well, uh, like um, gender and uh, weight, for example. And what we've actually found is that when you try and build models, if you include height and weight, weight actually comes out as the more, the better predictor. Um, so we've actually moved towards using weight in our newer uh, newer models. Um, but that's not to say height isn't a decent predictor. If you take out weight and you ignore that for the moment, and you just have height, then it is quite a good, well, it, it's just a predictor. You know, it's not a total predictor. Um, you know, it doesn't explain all the variation, but it explains a good bit of variation uh, in the finger strength scores. So essentially, it's that when we include body mass, it's because it takes in the height into it. Yeah. Then it's a it's a more encompassing uh, sort of aggregate uh, number that we're collecting or a piece of data that we're collecting because we know that a six foot eight climber who's very tall, obviously, is going to be a fair bit heavier than your typical climber, and likewise, a five foot four male climber is going to be. A fair bit lighter yeah. than that typical um, yeah, exactly. climber, so that's why it takes into both of those. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've got to be a bit careful here because it's what we're doing at the moment is modelling, and what we what we're kind of talking about now is like a um, more of a sort of scientific hypothesis. Right. So you've got to be quite careful about which you're looking at. So what we're doing is modelling. So what we're saying is, from the data we've seen, it looks like this, this, and this is true. What we can't say is, for certain, we know that height doesn't make a difference. Uh, what we can say is, we know weight and height, to a certain extent, seem to affect uh, the results we see. So it's kind of like a, is it, in some ways, it's kind of like a philosophical point of view. Um, it's, you know, I guess we're looking at it sort of from a pro uh, practical perspective. We're mainly interested in, can we make good predictions about people's finger strength? We're not, at the moment, necessarily looking at um, can we say for certain with a very high degree of confidence that height is definitely a factor? Okay, yeah. So 
So it's the difference between uh, hypothesizing and creating a model. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and that's why we're coming back to using the data to try and create the best possible models. Which yeah. I'll, I'll talk in a second about that uh, yeah, multi-factor yeah, exactly. model. That There's a, not to say that we're not interested in uh, testing these hypotheses, of course, but it's like a it's quite a different burden of proof almost. You know, that if you want to publish scientific literature, you need to do it with a very high degree of certainty. Um, whereas with the models, as long as we're confident we're getting reasonable results after our models, that's often enough. Um, you know, you don't have to say, for example, I can say with 99% confidence that this is definitely true. Uh, you know, we can, there's a sort of lower burden of proof almost. Ah, uh, in modelling versus scientific study? Yeah, well, it, the, I guess the overarching point is that as long as the models are practical and work well for us, that's as much as we need. Um, Whereas in science, you know, you're trying to convince everyone and, you know, you want, if anyone can come and ask you a question about it, you can say, you can show them the evidence and they'll say, oh yes, this makes sense. You know, they can run all the experiments themselves and they can, um, you know, they can repeat your testing and they can say again, they can you know, see your experiments and they can match your data and then make the same conclusions. Yeah, yeah. So I suppose this comes back to one of those things that you see quite a lot where people are kind of chatting about modelling or you see it on forums or talking on uh, you know, things like Facebook is that people can get very kind of bogged down in a total accuracy of modeling and they, they'll, they'll stand there and go, but I've seen issues with modeling. Uh, it can't be as accurate with this thing here. There's pitfalls in it. And the truth is, is that there are pitfalls and that it's not some perfect tool that makes, that explains everything. It's a powerful tool but it has to be used in conjunction with all the other things that we use for yeah, coaching totally. and training. Totally, yeah, um, yeah. As you say, it's not a, it's not that it's not the be all and end all. Um, you've got to, it's a, it's one of a suite of tools that you can use to um, improve your coaching and um, you know the, just the overall sort of training experience, I guess. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I mean, I definitely echo that in the experience I've had with coaching over the years is that. I would still happily be coaching now without any of this data and doing effective work with people, but it's so nice to be able to combine the years of experience in, you know, in air quotes, traditional coaching, plus all of the data and the analytics we can do and combine those two together because, well, you have a good toolbox, you, you yeah, generally yeah. do some decent work. Yeah, totally. Um, like I say, I think it's just... It it adds a lot to a traditional sort of coaching perspective. Um, and I think it will only continue to uh, continue to grow in that direction, I think. Yeah, um, yeah that's really interesting stuff. I think it's going to... Because as this is, again, back to the big data stuff, as we get more data, you can... Uh, not only can you produce better models for sort of our core, uh, core things like finger strength or uh, maximum moves on the lattice board, you can look at new kind of interesting models as well, like new perspectives. Um, so like one kind of interesting example would be at the moment we ask what's your best red point grade and we take that as a sort of proxy for climbing ability but actually we kind of know that there's a lot of variation within a climbing grade so you know say I climb 8A sport route that can mean very different things depending on where in the world you are so if you have them in Spain for example you know it could be a sort of 40 meter you know knee bars everywhere big toothers just getting really tired but not really getting you know pulling any really hard moves Whereas if I'm here in the Peak District and I'm like on the Peak Limestone, it could be five moves, ten moves, and then you're at the, at the chains and that's it. You know, So they're very different things. Mm. And it's like, if someone says, oh, I've climbed 8A, that they mean their 40 minute sport route, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to get on well with the short Peak Limestone. But if you've got this big piece of data, say, um, you know, say sometime in the future, everyone records everything they ever climb and you can look back at the past six months of climbing, you could look at every route they've done in the past six months and use that as a, a better measure for climbing ability. So having these big data sets can really help you uh, look at kind of new uh, new perspectives on things. So I'm just going to adjust my microphone a bit because it seems to be a bit wayward. Oh, we got it gone right on you. <laughs> <laughs> Chasing me. There you go, I think we're back in. Technical issues. <laughs> Technical glitches. I wonder if we've got one of those little like holding screens that we can put up for people. I like, have on the uh, 
BBC you know with the uh, no broadcast yeah if only if only <laughs> one day <laughs> yeah so can you tell me a little bit about our multi-factor model that you've been developing in this last year and, yeah. and how that all works uh, so basically we've been looking quite closely at the different factors that affect uh, finger strength in particular uh, so obviously finger strength is one aspect of climbing performance but it's sort of quite an important one um, so we put quite a lot of time and effort into uh, trying to make our models as good as we can. Um, so what we've done is we've gone through the different uh, variables we've collected and we've worked out the ones which explain the most variance in finger strength. So of particular interest are gender and weight. Um, these seem to be big explanatory factors in uh, people's finger strength. Um, so for example, if you're a, a female climber, um, for a given grade you can typically get away with between 5 and 10% less finger strength than a male climber climbing at the same grade. Um, so I guess this kind of goes back to the um, modelling versus science. So if you're looking at the, from the science perspective, you'd be like, why is that? But from a modelling perspective, we, you know, just to know that seems to be, yeah, that seems to be what happens in the data. That's kind of enough for us. Um, mm. So for a female climber, we don't necessarily say, oh, actually, you need to, you're really weak fingers, you need to gain five ten percent finger strength which could you know that could be like years of work for them uh, we can say oh actually we know you're a female climber obviously uh, so we kind of expect your finger strength to be five or ten percent less than your male counterparts so actually you know your finger strength is about where we expect it um, and then you can say uh, so, you know and then you save them you know a year of finger warning perhaps um, to make those finger strength gains they don't otherwise have to yeah because it all comes down to ultimately is identifying those weak factors or the, the less high performing factors in the profile and going after those things. So if we're to we're not we if we're not running a, a sophisticated enough model, it would be easy to misidentify the correct thing to then go and do the training on. So we could easily have a a female climber who we finger strength assess, but if we haven't got that multi factor model then we can make uh, those conclusions about how the gen gender and weight will affect that score, we could end up saying to that person, you need to hammer the fingerboard training for the next three years for any chance to climb 8B+. But in fact, if we look at the model and we look at that multi-factor model, it says, no, you're, you're more or less in exactly the right kind of zone. So it's just more of a case of steady gains or, or maintenance work and the focus should come somewhere else. Yeah, no, that's exactly it. Um... So you previously, we, you know, as a coach, you have kind of intuitive ideas about this. You know, so I'm sure you've realised in your coaching that you know, as when you see a female climber, they typically have weaker fingers for a certain grade. But it's being able to quantify that and you know have that down in sort of hard numbers. So it's not just saying, uh, okay, so we think your finger strength should be here, but you know, we know you're a female, so you know we can't expect your finger strength to be a little bit less than what we'd expect. So we think you're kind of in the right ballpark. You know, we can say. Uh, with a lot more certainty uh, so we know your finger strength should be five to ten percent less than uh, where we normally expect it um, so we can you know we can put sort of hard numbers on exactly where we think your finger strength should be yeah yeah yes i mean uh, as a coach i've really enjoyed seeing the development of that model and likewise the development of what we've done with all the lattice board testing the remote testing and getting more and more pinpointed in what we're doing because I've, I've climbed for, well, I must be close to 20 years now and I've coached for a very long time and I've had so many kind of inbuilt assumptions with how things work and to be able to check some of those assumptions and then be able to use some nice objective data to work out how far are we away from things, how much improvement do we need is it's just really nice and I guess that's what makes me every single week get up and go I want to do more of this because I think we can it's probably that search like you know the whole search to the answer for everything is <laughs> hopefully we all we all think we can get to the the answer yeah yeah no totally yeah it's really good like I guess it it kind of goes back almost to that like very first time we met when I was like oh, you know what like what should I be pulling on the fingerboard to be able to put numbers and all that sort of stuff it's amazing and as you kind of dig into it more and more, you find all these little um, sort of little added extras that you, you know, little discoveries that you come across in the data, um, and it just kind of helps expand your understanding of climbing and coaching, 
and then that all feeds back in and it's just like just to be able to expand your um mental picture of how everything works together it's just like yeah so much fun it's really good yeah yeah oh, i do i do like it though we all love this it's great <laughs> um okay last one what's next for us where are where are we going where are you going where's the data going oh very good question um so hopefully we'll get lots more data that'll be good um obviously we've got the app being released um, and i think that's like going to be a, a really interesting platform to be able to uh, see how people are performing um I think in particular, it'd be very interesting to see, we might be able to start getting some data about how how effective particular sessions are. Um, mm. you know, so at the moment, uh, data on particular uh, sort of training interventions is pretty sparse, I guess would be a generous way of putting it. Um, but if we've got, if you have a lot of people using the app and they're sort of testing regularly through the app as well, uh, we can get some way towards seeing you know, what's working well for people, what doesn't work, even if it's just really broad stuff, like you know, lots of people just saying, oh, actually, I don't really like this session. That in itself is really valuable because people don't do sessions they don't like, for the most part. Um, so, yeah, I think that's going to be a really interesting avenue, just that, because it just allows you to collect that much more data. Um, it's kind of new and interesting data as well, like a lot of which we won't have seen before. Um, it's, and it's hard trying to track down exactly what people are getting up to. I mean, this is a battle that we face every week, every month, where we're asking people, what did you actually do in the last month, six months? And it's, I suppose it's a bit exactly like that self-assessment that we've seen climbers do over the years. They, they think they have strong fingers or they think they're fit or all these different elements of their climbing is people can have some really, I suppose, misguided uh, thoughts about how much they did, when they did it, and the pattern of their activity and if we're able to analyse that with more objectivity we can one understand the history way more accurately and then two is monitor the training and how effective certain methods and protocols are and see the kind of re response from that. Oh yeah yeah totally yeah it'd be amazing to um, yeah just getting that kind of bigger picture um, like you say because it's so easy to uh, build up kind of an intuitive image in your head that it's actually it's not quite right you know you I guess it's you know if you're doing like really hard sessions they always feel like they take longer you always feel more tired at the end and you in your mind you always kind of over egg how much work's involved um, but to be able to have that kind of um, big picture view of uh, how this session's actually going and you know how your training's actually going um, I think that'll be really really good yeah yeah oh so much to do <laughs> so much to do yeah, I know not enough time <laughs> yeah I know well we'll keep plugging on and uh, <laughs> and carry, yeah, carry on what we're doing. It's been a pretty good year so far. So yeah, that's been yeah, good fun. Um, I think the other interesting thing as well with this increase in data is um, hopefully we'll have to start looking at more interesting models as well. Um, so like I was saying before about um, measuring climbing ability using your kind of history, of, uh, history of ascents. Um, I think that you know, doing things like that could really change the way we look at a lot of... You know, I think it would be a big perspective shift in how we look at climbing performance and uh, analyse performance in general, I guess. Yeah, it's essentially creating a better model for this whole issue we talked about previously of when someone says, what, what grade do you climb? And they come up with this number. You yeah, know there's, yeah. there's, some, there's definitely some issues of that and why we've been doing work on saying things like, red point in 10 sessions, how much quickly do you think you can climb something in three sessions, what's your on-site grade and creating a bigger picture for sure when it starts to come down to logged ascents and activities, even in training sessions themselves, you can have oh yeah, way better understanding of the true grade that someone's operating at and then all the ramifications of that for their training and their assessments and everything. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, like you say, it's just getting that, uh, yeah, that sort of bigger picture of what's actually going on um, you get taking a more objective view, whereas at the moment, you know, just kind of by necessity, it's quite subjective. You know, if, like you say, if you ask someone what grade do you climb, that's a, it's quite a big open question, really, isn't it? You know, does it is that if you've done it once, is that enough? If you've done it five times, is that enough? If you can do it in three sessions, does that count? Or, you know, if you do it in fifteen sessions, is that too much? It's like yeah, it's such a um, such a broad. Uh, well, I guess there's so much variation in there. Um, trying to nail down some of that variation. Just lets you produce much better models, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, future's looking bright. Yeah. So there you have it. 
I hope you've enjoyed some of our data delving with Remus. It's been a real privilege to have Remus on board over the years. I'll, I also want to do a quick shout out to my sister who very kindly dipped out of her PhD this year to help a little bit. Um, she'd kill me if I don't say anything. And the work that Remus has brought to what we do with the data, the software, the the analysis, everything has just been so um, invaluable and I'm, I'm so psyched for what we're going to do for the rest of this year and going into 2019 and everything and what we'll always try and do is continue to share that with all of you and hopefully keep it as useful and as educational as possible and um, we'll, we'll just keep moving forward. So I hope you've enjoyed this and that's over and out from me and from Remus. Thanks cool. so much. Yeah, goodbye. Thanks for, uh, thanks for taking the time to interview. It's been good fun. Yeah, it's been cool. It's not been too painful for the first one. Yeah, no, it's been good. It's just like a nice little casual conversation. I was a bit worried it'd be a bit too formal, but uh, yeah, no, it's been nice. It's just good, like good chat down the office, really. Yeah, nothing's formal with me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, thanks for listening and um, goodbye.